The VLAB Award is a tradition that we started many years ago. It's an award that goes to individuals or organizations that have outstanding endeavors to support the entrepreneurship community or to make uh, a sustainable impact. And so today, please help me welcome once again Dr. Ayman Smail to announce the Spring 22 Award. Thank you so much, Noor. So, uh, the person that I'm going to talk about today, I met him probably more than 20 years ago. Uh, at that time, he was working in an oil and gas company. He was very proud of his work at the beginning of his career. Uh, he went to do his master's in SOAS, the School of African International Studies, if I mention it correctly, or maybe the wrong name. And then he got there inspired with things that are beyond business and using business to change the world. Came back to Egypt worked a little bit again in the oil and in gas industry, and very quickly he wanted to focus on the energy sector, but change it in a different way towards green, renewable, and also making people's lives a little bit better. Um, I remember 2011, we went to Al Wahat Al Bahareya. I went there with him to see his very first project at the time, and it was basically desert and pretty much nothing. Uh, and now there is something out of it, and I'll tell you about it in a second. Uh, he had the aspiration to change that sector. At that point, people thought this is crazy. Today, everybody's talking about green. We're going to have Ashley Sara talking about what's happening. We have the COP27. Even everybody's talking about it. Climate resilience, renewable, circular economy, green, solar, all of these things. Uh, at that point in time, uh, he had a very interesting idea, which I think came out of his thesis, that if you want to, in Egypt, everybody lives at the Nile because we live on the grid. We're connected, we're connected to water, we're connected to energy. The only way that we can actually go outside is what people call disconnected communities, is you need to have energy that creates water, that creates everything else around it. If you have energy and water, you can live. You can build, you can have agriculture, industry, transportation, and everything. And the only way to do that is by having renewable energy at that uh, location. Started uh, the company at that point in time, 11 years ago, 2011. Started from scratch and kind of uh, at that point in time, nobody was interested in that space as much as people are interested in it to do. The company was very special. One of the very few companies in Egypt that actually had real R&D, invested in technology and tried to operate in a very challenging environment. And today it's probably one of the leading, if not the leading company in that sector with a lot of interesting ideas that nobody imagined uh, that can happen, uh, connecting with policymakers, with industry, with business in different ways. And uh, a story that's full of persistence and very interesting ideas that we're gonna talk about a uh, few, min few minutes ago. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this year's award to Ahmad Zahran and Karm Solar, a person who led the space in renewable energy. So Ahmed, so let's first start from the beginning. What's the story of Karm Solar? What did you guys do? How did it start? I mean, I mentioned the teaser, but would love to hear the story from you. Um, first, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, back home. I mean, this place brings a lot of uh, memories. And uh, <coughs> really, I mean, I, I, I want to thank AUC for always being engaged with uh, the community and keeping us in touch and, and engaged until today. I'm still very engaged for, with AUC, and I'm, this is something I'm very thankful for and something I learned a lot from. Um, how did it start? I uh, was mandated to solve an energy problem of a farm in Wadi Natrun, and I went there in 2010, uh, right before the revolution. And basically, um, it was an off-grid farm. They were not connected to the energy grid, and they were consuming a lot of diesel. And I was trying to work on a solution from biogas, collecting the waste that they have, the organic waste, and building a reactor to convert that waste into a gas that they can use instead of burning diesel. And it seemed quite a complicated thing to do. And I remember very well, it was uh, March 2010, and it was quite sunny. And I wondered, why aren't we using uh, solar energy? And I started investigating that, and it seemed that there was a technical problem that prevents us from using solar energy for water pumping, which was the main 
use of energy at the time in those types of farms. And that's the thing that started the company, solving that problem, coming up with a technical solution that enables pumps to use uh, solar energy efficiently to pump water from the underground. And have you solved that problem by now? We did. Actually, that was one of the first things that we did. Um, and the first pump operated on the 6th of April 2013. And uh, it was a 50 kilowatt station right next to our uh, Bahareya campus. And uh, that was a big win for us. I mean, it took us six months to build 50 kilowatts. By solar standards, that's, uh, that's a joke. Uh, within the, that same time, you can build many megawatts of solar stations now. So where are you today? So this has been a decade and things have changed. The whole environment have changed. Where is Carm Solar today? Well, we um, are becoming a vertically integrated solar utility company. So we invest in power generation. We invest in power distribution and we in try to integrate the entire value chain. So basically, we want to, uh, you know, the, the unit with which you, me you measure electricity, the one that you uh, see in your meters at home is called the kilowatt hour. So basically, we want to take care of the kilowatt hour from the moment it is born until the moment it is burnt in our homes, in our factories, and so on. And that's a very long process. It uh, requires the power generation, power stations, uh, the power distribution, which is the grid that actually carries that kilowatt hour from one place to the other, Power management, power trading, it's very complicated. It involves the building within which it is uh, consumed. Uh, you know, you visited our Bahareya campus. Now we're constructing another campus in the desert of Minya. Uh, it should be completed within a month. And a third campus in um, uh, Farafra. And the fourth in Marsala. So we're actually expanding all over the Egypt and hopefully uh, the region as well. So this is where we are today. We're in places uh, that might be uh, familiar to you. So we're actually generating and distributing electricity in Mars Alam, uh, in the deep south. That's where we've also designed and helped build a very nice hotel that is uh, sustainable and works partly on solar. Uh, we are in West Cairo in Arkan. We're in, we will be in East Cairo within a few weeks with uh, District 5, if you know the place. Uh, so we are trying to get uh, everywhere. We're in Minya, in Bahareya, Wadi Natrun, we're in many places. The space, the renewable space has changed a lot. So 10 years ago, the technology was still very nascent. There was no, there were no regulation. People were not educated. Demand was not there. Energy prices were reasonable. Now the whole environment has changed. So what does the environment for renewables look like in Egypt and globally, but more, mostly in Egypt right now? Egypt is a peculiar place when it comes to renewable energy. We, we always think of ourselves, unfortunately, as receivers of um, new technologies, new business ideas, and new business models, and so on. In, in the renewable energy space, particularly, uh, we have an advantage that we have a lot of land, and we, have, um, we, we are rich when it comes to resources in renewable energy, whether wind or solar, but, but specifically solar. And this is giving us the chance to cheaply try out new things. So Egypt is going to be uh, one of the important hubs for renewable energy globally because of that. And one of the main areas where there's a lot of development, it's not only on the technical side, but predominantly on the economic side. So you will see that the way we interact with our utilities, the, the companies that actually deliver water or deliver power to our houses, it is going to be uh, changing within the coming uh, few years. And I think that Egypt is going to play an important role in that because of that opportunity. And Ahmed, when people think about electricity, they always think about Shirkat the Kahraba, the government. Yes. This is a sector that's typically, I mean, everywhere in the world, it's dominant by the government because it requires a lot of huge investments in infrastructure. Yes. You're getting into that sector yes. and you're actually literally running grids in some location. Uh, working with the government, but working with different entities in those communities. How does that work? I mean, well, um, it's, um, I think we're much nicer. That's number one. But uh, also we offer uh, more value. I'll give you an example of something that we uh, piloted just a few months ago. So basically you have the power meter that you have at home. It's the only job that we've known for the power meter is it counts how much electricity we consume. But actually there's a lot more data on that power meter that we have not used. And in Egypt at the same time, we have a problem with SME financing. So when small companies go to the banks, 
they really go through hell in order to get a loan. And banks are trying to give loans to SMEs, but the process itself and the requirements are so difficult. So within the law in Egypt, it is actually possible that you develop a credit score from behavioral consumption. And what the power meter has, the power meters that are installed at small shops and small businesses, it says how much electricity they consume, it says whether they pay on time or not. So it enables financial institutions to get a credit score out of it. So one of the things that we started is that with your power meter, and soon this will be open for individuals, you can actually apply for a loan that you pay back on your power bill. And the collateral for that loan is effectively the power meter itself. If you don't pay the loan, we'll cut the electricity. So basically, this is changing how people perceive power meters. Another thing is, you know, if you're distributing electricity in a region, and within that region, the, the meters connected to our network, you have that of the shop, you have that of the office, you have that of residential homes, for example. So they're all paying us for electricity. At a certain point in time, within the coming two to three years, you will have the option of uh, going to a restaurant in your area and paying for it by your electricity credit. So instead of paying with your credit card, with your cash, you'll have the power app with which you pay for your power bill and you can show it over there and it will be scanned and the, the price of your meal will be charged to your power meter that you can pay later. So you're turning into a fintech company, embedded fintech? No, we're not going to touch it. We're providing the platform for the financial institutions to use it. So we're not taking that risk, but we're only making the money out of it. That's brilliant. <laughs> okay, Tab, uh, tell us about your vision for that space and your vision for Carm Solar. So where do you see this space going in the next five years? I think 10 years is just too long, but for the next five years in Egypt, whether it's renewables or particularly solar. You know, we had a problem in Egypt in the 80s. There were a lot of companies working on solar water heating. So a lot of companies importing the, the things that you install on top of the rooftops at our houses. And they're used to provide us with uh, heated water. And the problem is that many of those companies did not survive. So you'd install the system. And once you want the maintenance, it's not there. Now, this is a problem that this economy has in general institutionalization is a major issue. And this is one of the main things that we are working on. We are imagining this company not for the coming five years nor 10 years, but imagining the company for the coming 150 years. And the main thing that we need to work on, and really we're looking at uh, Siemens when it comes to that. Um, and uh, this is a company that managed in, you know, keeping its uh, innovation and uh, keeping its hold on the business for a very, very long time, I think more than 150 years now, or maybe 120 years. And this is exactly what we're trying to build. And I think that's the main contribution that our company is going to have, that we're investing a lot and putting a lot of effort into institutionalization to make sure that the company is stronger than the individuals within the company itself, and to make sure that it survives and keeps on innovating for the coming 100 years. Actually, I was going to ask you about the company itself and how do you build it, but I think this is a really nice segue. We know about the startup phase, so everybody here knows about what you do in the startup phase, but the scale-up phase and the institutionalization phase, how does that work? What do you do inside the company? When you start, you go from one person to 20, 30, 50, whatever, but to move beyond that and to keep have the continuity and the, an established business that you can actually, as you mentioned, can survive beyond any individual. How do you do that? How are you doing this yes. today? The, the first thing is that you have to make sure that the business model makes sense. They actually have a positive gross profit and you are on your path towards making a positive EBITDA. I mean, I'm saying that today because over the last three years, I discovered a lot of business models that do not function like that. And I thought that I'm already behind in so many different things. But, but actually, I think it still works. I mean, companies that do not guard those things as fundamental principles are not going to make it, uh, regardless of what the investors tell you, because investors could send you to hell as well. I mean, if you get uh, financing for a stupid idea, it could also be stupid money. So it doesn't really solve it. And I think that the business model is number one. Um, number two, it has to be a commitment by everyone for long-term decisions. 
Short-term decisions are very easy. And it is always easy to postpone doing certain things until the time is right, until we have more money. But what we started, I think, doing and um, you know, making sure that we invest into is, for example, the financial auditing. At the time when we were um, maybe five or six, I think employee number seven was a CFO, when we did not have to do that. But we thought it is important if we are to IPO in 15 or 20 years, that we have good records from very early on. Hiring a financial auditor, when the fee of the financial auditor was a burden on the finances of the company at the time. But we thought that having a good financial auditor installs a certain type of discipline that we would need. And it really helped us, you know, we, did, we really did not have to do that. But again, when you are thinking very long term, this puts a certain commitment on the team to do certain things that m might be easily postponed. And when we got EDFR as an investor on, in 2019, and that's a government company, so they had their own regulations that they have to abide to, this made our job much easier during the, the due diligence. And then you really have to be very patient and building up bit by bit. And in our case, for example, I mean, the value of the company is measured by how many megawatts we have installed, how many megawatts are operational. We don't just take any megawatt to expand. We only focus on quality megawatts. What's the meaning of quality megawatts? That's a quality client, uh, um, a profitable contract, uh, a contract that enables us to grow uh, not just in revenues, but revenues, profitability, in scale, and uh, making sure that while we are hiring our people that we're trying to install those ideals into them. At a certain point in time, when a small company is growing, there are friendships that build up between the people working there. And at another point in time, it has to change from a group of friends working together into an institution. And that's a very difficult bridge to cross. But it is a bridge that you have to cross to make sure that that company survives and actually grows in a meaningful way. How do you do that? A lot of hard decisions. Uh, a lot of unpopular decisions, but the, the whole idea is to make the organization stronger than the individuals. So me, as a CEO, I have to give up some of my abilities to take decisions to make sure that the board is more empowered and they have, um, uh, you know, they, they have oversight as to what I do, empowering the executive committee of the company more to make sure that they're involved with decision making, uh, making sure that recruitment is uh, you know, with recruitment, there are a lot of people involved with the decision-making. Uh, focusing on processes and paperwork, uh, focusing on digitalization. I mean, those things are important because they ensure that the company is going to grow and that, you know, let's take, for example, what happened during uh, the COVID pandemic. I mean, the company actually grew during the pandemic and that was an achievement for us. Uh, look at what's happening right now with the, with the current crisis, the supply chain crisis and the, and the investment crisis. We will be able to survive it and we will actually be growing during that period because we've built the, um, the processes internally and the types of ethics that are needed to be able to deal with those types of uh, situations. And you always have to design, you know, you design your product, but in addition to designing the product or service that you're giving, mm -hmm. you need to spend some time designing the company as well. And designing the company in a way that would enable it to deal with those types of circumstances and have the ability to grow. And that will definitely involve unpopular decisions. But it's not about popularity, I'm not there to be loved. Me and the executive committee and the chairman and the board are there to achieve the highest value for the shareholders, to make sure that people working with the company are getting their salaries every month, to make sure that they are doing financially better year on year, because the whole idea of doing all of that is to elevate our standard of living, elevate the standard of the infrastructure of the community, and to do that, you have to be very disciplined. So there is the whole story about your mission and vision and all the nice touchy-feely stuff, but at the end of the day, it boils down to doing business in the right way, making sure you have the people, the processes, really running a professional business. Yes, it, it is very difficult. When you have a written process, it's just written on a piece of paper. 
And that's very easy to be done. But converting it into a commitment that you have to do it over and over again, every time that you have to or every time that you do not have to, is difficult. It requires commitment like the one that you have in your marriage relationship or the one that you have with your friends or the one that you have towards your bank and paying the loan. It is that type of discipline, it is that type of commitment and uh, really bringing yourself to do it, whatever the consequences are. Ahmed, you talked about tough times and COVID. Uh, most companies, startups that started in the past couple of years, uh, they started in a relatively favorable environment and now we're hitting a crisis. Most of them have not been through the experience of going through a crisis. I've probably seen five or six recessions in my lifetime. You've been since 2011 through probably four or five. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and a couple of crises yeah. and a COVID and whatever. How do people manage those tough times? Beyond the rhetoric and the stuff that people um, talk about, be resilient, all of that, it, practically on the ground, what do you do? From your experience in the past ones. The, the first one is psychological, uh, which is being ready to pay the price. There is no crisis without a price being paid. And that has to be I mean, uh, straightforward and let's not hide behind, um, you know, uh, hopes. And the first thing is that the entire team need to be psychologically prepared to pay the price from their own income, from the opportunities that the company is going to get, from their ability to scale, and to focus on what is important. When you, uh, you know, we have one of the disciplines that we have, and I think this is very important, we, we have like a, a threshold for all of our projects. Before that threshold, we're allowed to uh, play and experiment and try everything and come up with crazy ideas and so on. But the projects that we push beyond that threshold, they have to make it and be implemented. And we wanted to have that discipline to make sure that the people only push the projects that they really believe in and they want to get done. And so far, our ability to complete the projects that, that have crossed that threshold is almost 100%. And that requires discipline. Really, it, it, it requires a lot of discipline and emotional detachment from projects. And I learned that through, um, I don't know if you know the, the name Khaled Hassouna. Khaled Hassouna was on our board for some time. And at the time, I was emotionally attached to one of our products, the solar pumping because it's the one that we've, uh, we've uh, built uh, and we have the patent for it and it was uh, quite, uh, uh, it's a genius product. It's very sophisticated. You know, you had different pumping stations talking to each other, doing weather forecast. It was really I mean, kick-ass product. But the fact that some small shops, small engineering shops in the countryside, they came up with a product that was, I think, 30% of our price. And it, did, it was not sophisticated at all, and it did a fraction of what we've done. And it, I, will, I mean, the, the lifespan of our product was like 25 years. The lifespan of their product was five years. But they had something that we did not have, that the market did not care about any of what, of what we've done. And they cared about their product. It was more attractive because of the price. And our product was failing in front of our eyes. But I was emotionally attached to the product, and I kept trying hard, pushing the team to try hard with it, when we should have buried it. And it was Khaled Hassouna who pointed that out and told us that we have to move on. And at the time of a crisis, teams will be confronted with the same thing. You have a problem raising money. You probably have a negative EBITDA. You are seeking a positive cash flow. Investors are suddenly changing their mind. And if you, if you don't take those types of decisions, what to focus on and what to carry on with and what to kill, um, the chances of the company surviving are going to just go down. And the first thing is that the entire team has to be psychologically prepared for that. And I mean it. I mean, the, the executive committee or the bigger middle management need to talk face to face and decide what they're going to do. Tough times call for very interesting things. Last words of wisdom, advice for someone who's thinking about starting a company today in this very interesting environment. Should they do that? And if they do, how do they do it? One of the biggest questions when you are starting something, specifically a company, is 
when should I stop? When should I pull the plug and declare that it is a failure? And that, the only person who knows the answer to that question is the person going through that journey himself or herself. When do I decide that it is not going to work? It's a very difficult decision because maybe, uh, you know, some, in the past we used to give, uh, you know, we used to hear the guidelines of one year. Try for one year. If it doesn't work, then leave it. But maybe it's one year and one month. Maybe it's two years. It really differs. And the one thing that I would advise anyone is to have certain milestones and try to make them as close to each other as possible and as small as possible. So very small milestones, maybe one every month, one every two months, just to make sure that you have traffic lights of what is telling you to carry on and stop. Because at a certain point in time, if things do not go the way that you want, you will want data to support whether you should carry on or not. And it might not be related to how much you've spent, it might be related to how many milestones you've achieved that are telling you that you're on the right direction. And make sure that you have a bit of savings before you do that. That's fantastic. Most of the people for the past couple of years were more excited about the, the growth, grow, grow, grow at any cost. And I think in those times where economies are globally is getting into a challenging part, it's very important to listen to the wisdom of people who have done it with the cycles of ups and downs and who have the resilience. And resilience is not just a dictionary word. It's actually something practical about being psychologically ready, managing the cash flow, preparing to do the tough choices, sometimes killing some products or businesses to make sure the company is continuing. And I think the theme for the next year is more about surviving. But for new startups, I think it's a great time to start as long as you understand the environment that you're in and you can build something that people want and can pay money uh, for. Ahmed, thank you so much. Congratulations. Very proud of everything you've done. And uh, I think some of those ideas are things that would love to have everybody listen to and take them forward. Thank you thank so much, you. Ahmed.